And so these are Darwin's two fundamental ideas that he uh, emphasized in this book. One is that populations change over time, which nobody argues. Populations do change over time. No one anywhere argues that. And that they change by means of something called natural selection, is how he termed it. Um, now that has been developed over the years. That was his two main ideas. Populations change, they change due to natural selection. And one of the famous stops he made was this uh, archipelago of islands off the west coast of South America, the Galapagos. Very, very famous islands. And on this island, uh, he was able, on this archipelago, he was able to move from island to island and just take observations. And one of the observations that he discussed a lot were the birds on those islands. So he noticed something about finches, that finches are not the same on all these islands. So you have this finch here, the vegetarian tree finch. A uh, really short, really stout bill. Um, you have this little guy up here, the warbler finch, with a very sort of delicate needle-like bill. Uh, and you have all kinds of variations between them, uh, bird color and bin, and uh, bill size and shape. And so he thought, now listen, did God create unique finches for all those islands in the Galapagos? Probably not. It doesn't make sense. Or did a population of finches arrive in those islands that were all the same? And over time, that population changed. And some had beaks became bigger, and some became smaller, which is almost certain. Well, it is certain. That's exactly what happened. And so now we have all these different species of spinches, of spinches or even you know, finches. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it has been very, very well documented. He's very, very famous for that. Right? So that's a really common. And nobody argues that, by the way. Nobody argues that. The argument comes in not can finches change their size of beaks based on environment and the kind of seeds available, but did a finch come from something that wasn't a finch in the first place? Did birds come from something that wasn't a bird in the first place? That's where the argument comes from. So that is sort of his famous, famous stop. And so he wrote this book, and in this book he had one picture. Try writing a science book today with one picture. <laughs> one picture. If you ever have trouble sleeping, start reading on the origin of species. That is a snooze. <laughs> it is hard reading. But I had this picture in it. This is his tree, his evolutionary tree, a, a portion of it anyway. And so what he did is he says, look, this is what we see today. Everything at the top is what we see in existence today. But those came from something that was a little bit different than them. Those finches did. And so you can go down the tree, you can find something that's a little bit different. But all those finches came, let's say this is the population finch. Well, that came from some bird, in his view, that was different. And that came from something that was different. And eventually go down far enough, and all the things we see up here, eventually all converge. Here he has, what, eight or nine sort of letters, but with dots going down. Eventually, you'll end up with what today is called the last universal common ancestor, Luca, L-U-C, the last universal common ancestor. So you have this tree with all these many, 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 many branches on it that all converge into a single trunk. Life arose from the tree. And so Darwin's tree is this iconic image right, that is part of evolution, and that is just because of the standard things. So, what I mean by evolution tonight is this. Biological evolution refers to the scientific theory that living things share ancestors from which they have diverged. Sometimes called the simple modification. That can't come, that definition comes directly from uh, the National Science Teachers Association policy statement, which I accessed about three years ago, in April 2016. Now, as it's stated there, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, living things do share ancestors, from which they are now a little bit different. That's true. But that is not what Darwinism says. Darwinism goes much farther than that. Evolution is much more than that definition suggests, so we need to illustrate that this way. I took a course called Human History and Evolution. It's an upper division course, elective, at the University of Florida. The professor was an excellent professor. Excellent. She had done a lot of work with National Geographic. She was a paleontologist, um, led the U.S. research team that went over to Egypt to study King Tut's tomb and all that kind of stuff. I think she's at New York University. Really good teacher. And a really nice lady, too. We had some couple discussions. This was in the notes she gave me. I reviewed them today just to make sure I had this right. She said, science is this. Science is empirical evidence and continual testing. In other words, science is based on what we can sense. Right? It's the physical universe. That's what science is. And that's true. I don't have any problem with that. Science studies what you can sense. You can scope it or telescope it or read it or something, meter it. You can, you can, it's, 
That's science. That's what we study is the natural physical world. But Darwin is much, much more than that definition of science. Darwinism insists that nature is all there is. It insists on a belief, and the belief is called materialism. That all that exists is the natural world, is the physical universe. Nothing else is beyond that. Which means that doesn't fit with the definition on the screen, does it? If science is empirical, that means you can, you can, you can sense it. If science itself is empirical, but it's built on a belief of material, can you sense material? Can you, pro can you prove materialism? Can you test the idea that nature is all there is. You can't test that. Right? That is an untestable belief. It's a belief, which is fine. So we choose to do that. But that is a belief. What Darwinism is, is the insistence that materialism is the truth. And everything is based upon that. We'll see that as we go through. And that very much clouds the way you interpret the world then that you're studying. So the rest of my notes in this little uh, diagram is this. Science is empirical evidence of continual testing. Belief is faith and doctrine. And what she was trying to do is polarize what we're studying in science in the history of human evolution versus beliefs about the history of humanity, like creation, for example, which is what she was getting to. That science studies what we can know. Belief studies faith, meaning you believe it because someone told you to. And doctrine, meaning you believe it and if you don't believe it, something bad's going to happen to you. You're going to get kicked out of the room. That's what she meant by that. You're told what to believe. And not because there's any reason to it, you just have faith in it. And you all have enough background and critical thinking skills to recognize that anything built upon a philosophy of materialism is built upon a foundation of faith. Materialism has to be faith, because it's an idea. It's a concept. You can't test it. It is untestable. And so in the contrast, science claims to be the way things really are, where any supernatural ideas, well, that's just mythology, it's superstition, it is untestable, at worst it's authoritarian, and so keep your religious ideas of creation over here, we are doing science. And that is flagrantly and demonstrably wrong. And you need to know that, because the world ain't going to teach you that. Academics certainly ain't going to teach you that. And we'll illustrate that here as we go. All right, hanging with it? Okay, y'all are bright people, but it is you know, approaching dead week, and some of you wear that adjective already. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, what is evolution? All right, that's what evolution is. Evolution, what I mean by that word is uh, belief in the materialism, <laughs> dead, <right? laughs> Belief in materialism, and that all living things must have come from some material source. So what's intelligent design then? We're trying to contrast these two things. In short, I think this is a reasonable definition, a theory for how we may properly conclude something is designed by an intelligent source. Does it look designed or not? It doesn't presume materialism. It allows for something more than that. Intelligent design does. And we do this all the time. Key, key difference here. To ask, was something designed? is a different question than, well, who designed it, or what designed it? Those are two very different questions. Science can lead you to the first question. Was, in fact, it does all the time. Science leads us to this question. Was this designed? All the time we conclude this was designed, this was not. Um, for instance, science. Was it murder, or was it an accident? That's this question, right? Was it designed, or was it an accident? Um, is this a weapon? Or is this just some old rock? Is that a sling stone? Because they know that. People who know this stuff know that. Because it looks designed. That's how they know that. Your professors do this all the time. Was this plagiarism? Or is this similarity just really circumstance? And we put people in jail, we kill them all the time based on the premise of uh, professor's don't. Culture does. <laughs> based upon the principle of just, you may want to occasionally, but. <laughs> We take away their property, we take away their rights, we take away their life, answering this question, was this designed or not? So we do this all the time. We look to decide was something intelligently purposed or was it accidental. It happens all the time. Here's a quick illustration. And I used this last year. Some of you here last year. Sorry for the repeat. I'll say these are a bunch of rocks in, in um, the green space. 
out there. The campus lawn. Right? Just randomly arranged rocks. Would anybody look at that and say that arrangement was intelligently designed? Probably not. Because intelligence has a signature to it, and everybody knows it. Insurance companies know it, professors know it, scientists know it. Intelligence leaves a signature behind it. And in fact, it's pretty hard not to leave a signature behind it. That this is harder than most people think. If you take those same rocks and just put them in a different arrangement, before I do that, let me make this one. Notice that this arrangement is almost infinitely unlikely to happen. Almost infinitely improbable. Right? Let's take this rock right here. Move it a tenth of a centimeter this way. That's a new arrangement, right? That's different than this one. Move it another tenth, and then another tenth, and then another tenth. The chance that these rocks are exactly as they are, where they are, is almost infinitely small if you try to calculate the probability of it. You follow that idea? So you can move all those rocks for ridiculously you know, small amounts, and so you have just infinite improbability. So low probability is not enough to say something was intelligent. It's not enough. It has to be a lot more than, well, that isn't likely to happen. What if you saw those rocks in this arrangement? <laughs> <laughs> now, they may question the intelligence, but <laughs> nobody would wonder if that was purpose or accident. And it's not just that it's unlikely to happen, for maybe more than one reason, <laughs> But it has another signature to it, right? It, it leaves a signature, and I, I'm not going to talk about all that signature tonight, so we don't really have time to do that. But people have done that. What, may, what is the signature of intelligence? And they've sort of defined it in all these different kinds of characteristics. But this has it. So does a plagiarized paper. So does usually a murder victim. So does insurance fraud, often. That uh, leaves a signature of intelligence behind. And so we make those decisions all the time. And science does it all the time in every branch of science where you're not allowed to do it, is where did we come from? Where did life originate? And there's reasons for that. Arrangement of rocks, random or intelligence, nobody questions. So, uh, let's, now I'm gonna give a specific example. I'm gonna try to do this quickly. Specific example. We're gonna get a little, little detailed here, but not too much, so stay with me. We're gonna get into the cool stuff. There's, a, there's like protein names and things involved. It's, it's going to be fun. So, well, all you communication majors here, just, you know, this is what you're missing. Uh, everybody talks about vision because the eye is an incredible organ. Even Darwin did this very famous statement of Darwin. To suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for emitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. And then he goes on to say, but I think that's how it happened, and this is how it happened. So Darwin is honest enough to say, look, this organ is incredible. His answer to that is, well, of course it didn't just happen. Nobody thinks it just, there's God, because that's ridiculous. This is the idea of how the eye happened. Uh, take the human eye and make an eye just a little less perfect. Some of you have eyes like that, right? Because you're wearing glasses, right? Jean loves this talk. I love it. She's having a good time. I take that eye, make it a little less perfect. And that eye, and just a little less perfect. You get the idea? And so here's the story. Take any organ and make it just a little le less perfect. And you have, just do that as many times as you need to, as many hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of times as you need to. And you just make it a little less functional, and eventually you end up at the very first starting organ, a cell that had a light-sensitive spot. And that's where vision began. That's the story. And you can read that story lots of places. Richard Dawkins, a very famous evolutionist, uh, talks about that specific thing in his book, The Blind Watchman. He'll talk about where the eye originated. And in a couple of pages, he just lays it out so simply that this is just clearly how it happened. That's very similar, folks, to Rudyard Kipling. You guys know Rudyard Kipling? Author. He wrote Jungle Book. He wrote this set of stories called Just So Stories, which are great stories for kids. Where the elephant gets its trunk, where the armadillo gets its shell, that kind of stuff. And there are all these stories of, oh, obviously the elephant got its trunk, and he tells this story, and so that's just so. That's just so that happens. There's a difference in telling a story and being able to show empirical evidence that that's how it happened. In science, you're supposed to show empirical evidence that that's how it happened. There's a big difference in writing a story that sounds good and having the empirical evidence to back it up. 
What I want to do is not talk about how complex the human eye is. I want to go back to a single cell that is sensitive to light. This guy. So halo back to here. It can't tell what direction light's coming from. It just knows whether it's in light that's healthy for it or light that's not healthy for it. And it can react to that. If it wants to be around healthy light, it wants to get out of light that can kill it. Because just like you, the wrong kind of light's going to burn you. Um, it can kill you, ultimately, right? It can give you cancer, you don't get a drink, you can die. Bacteria the same way. Light can be good or bad for uh, Halo bacteria are this group in red. Really, it's not a bacteria technique, it's kind of an old name for it. But all living things are dumped into these three groups. You're either a bacteria, which are one cell. Okay. You're a eukaryote, which is anything that has a nucleus inside the cell. That's a eukaryote, that's you, in case you're a communication major. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> that's you. And, and then there are. I'm sorry. <laughs> And then there are archaea, who they used to think were bacteria, but now they realize a lot of their biochemistry is different enough, they locked them in their own group. This guy is an archaea. So a very simple organism, very simple organism, but profoundly complex at the same time. Uh, without any stimulus, these guys just sort of swim around around. They have a little tail, a little gel on it, kind of tail thing, and they'll swim. And every once in a while they'll swim in a direction, then they stop, they float in three-dimensional space, and they start swimming again. And it's just random. Wherever they're pointing, that's where they go. Uh, in the presence of light, either good or bad, they're going to swim more in one direction or the other, either away from it or towards it. And that's what you have over here. And what happens is, if they realize they're swimming towards light that's good, they swim longer. There's signals that tell their flagella, don't stop. If they realize they're swimming into light that's bad for them, they'll keep swimming to get out. And so eventually, they can sort of actually run in a direction. Because they realize, hey, it's good light. Anytime they're going that direction, they swim longer. Anytime they're going the other direction, they stop and they swim shorter. So you end up, though you're turning randomly in space, actually going a specific direction. Kind of a cool, cool way to do it. How did that happen? What does it take to have a single cell that's sensitive to light? Because that's how it began. It's one thing to say that. It's thing to know how that, how that possibly could work. All right, this is what it takes to sense light. Remember this, though. Sensing light is not enough. To be of any good, you need to be able to sense light or dark, but you also need uh, to be able to communicate that information to the little flagellum that's swimming around. You have to tell it, stop moving, or hey, keep moving and don't stop. But you've got to communicate to that. You also have to be able to integrate that information with all kinds of other information coming into the cell. What minerals are around there? What kind of nutrients are around? What's the pH of the environment? Uh, how many other cells are near you? And all that stimulus, bacteria are getting all that. And all that's going to influence its movement, among other things. And you have to be able to react to all that communication. Continually, right? So it's not simple. It doesn't, can't it sense light? Can't it do anything with it? Right? Otherwise, it doesn't make any difference. So here's the fun. All right? I'm not going to give you a lot of names, but just, just a few. Sensory right? Rhodopsin 2. Not bad. SR2. That's not too intimidating, right? Sensory Rhodopsin 2. Uh, it's, this, it's this protein that sits in the membrane of a cell. Every cell has the outer boundary. Remember this from high school, right? The cell membrane. In this picture, it's uh, represented by these little purple bubbles with the little green legs on it. But that's the cell membrane. And here's the inside of the cell, and here's the outside of the cell. You have this protein that one end of it's sticking outside, the other end of it's sticking inside, and the cell zig this uh, protein zigzags through the cell membrane a bunch of times. So it comes up, and then loops around, and then comes back through again, and then goes up. Get the idea? It passes in and out of this membrane seven times. Buried in the middle of that protein is another little protein, here in pink, called retinol. And retinol has the unique ability to change shape when it gets hit by light. It changes its shape. You don't know what retinol looks like? Doesn't actually look at all like that, but that's how we even draw it. That's a chemical stick figure. That's retinol. And uh, everywhere you see two lines join, that means there's a carbon atom there. It's stuff sticking off of it. So that's what retinol is. This little protein sticking inside this great big protein. Um, and in its normal, sort of just hanging out shape, that's what it looks like. When it gets hit by the right kind of light, that joint pivots like that. So it's just hanging out, and when light hits it, it just goes down. And that triggers all kinds of things in that cell. 
It's very much like sending a message in here. If I, just for the fun of it, hit Nolan and say, send that message, and he hits Brett, which would be just as much fun. And he would kindly shake hands with it and just peel it. <laughs> and the message would go up. Yeah, that idea, that's what the cell does. It's this, this cascade of information where one molecule talks to another molecule, talks to another molecule, and all that has to happen. In so when retinol gets hit by the right kind of light, it changes its shape. Because it's sandwiched inside, because it's sandwiched inside this big molecule, it makes that big molecule change its shape. And it has to be attached in the middle here at just the right point, at just the right place. When that sensory rhodopsin 2 feels retinol do its flippy thing, it goes to this whole cycle of shape changes. Here comes the light, whammo, hits it. It goes to this thing, and then one microsecond ends up here. After 30 microseconds, it's at this stage, and then zip, 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 zip around. And so that's doing this thing. Okay. Chemical transformer, that's what it's doing. Right. And light started this. Right. Photon of light hits retinol, it, and then <laughs> Good? All the business man. I don't know, I really do. Well, that, that's fine, but all you have is proteins up in the cell membrane just doing their little, their dance, right? So what, who cares? Because they're just up in the cell membrane, the flagellum is way somewhere else. How are you going to talk to that thing? Well, there's another protein that sits right next to sensory rhodopsin, and it's this guy, HTR. And so part of it, this is a very cartoonish picture, but it's how we draw them uh, for ourselves. Uh, this is the inside of the cell. Uh, here's this little thing, right? Part of the protein is sticking down inside the cell. Really important, there's a lot of it down here, right? This little blue area is actually really important. And then part of it is sticking outside the cell, but it lies right next to this gap. And so really you have this arrangement. Here's the sensory rhodopsin 2 in red. Uh, you get two of them. And here's that little HDR protein in green. And so when retinol changes its shape, sensory rhodopsin 2 changes its shape, it's going to interact and change the shape of the HDR protein next to it. If you look down, it looks like this. Sensory rhodopsin in red, HDR in green. So you have two pairs. Right? Your sensory rhodopsin in HDR and another sensory rhodopsin in HDR. Cool? Is this fun? Good. No one likes it. <laughs> this little piece, labeled here TN2, of the HDR protein is talking to this, these two right here, F and G, the sensory adoption. When these things change right, it, they talk this transmembrane, TM2 piece, we use that word, transmembrane. And essentially, those things all interact. So you have light, retinol, and sensory adoption 2, talking to HDR, and that, because it has this big piece sticking down inside the <coughs> cell to wiggle around, is going to talk to the cell down inside. And it's going to talk to this little protein called CHEA. Now, this is a whole set of proteins called CHE proteins. And their job is to carry messages. That's what they do. They're the runners of the cell. And they do it by using something called phosphate. You've heard of phosphate before, probably. Uh, phosphate's a very common switch. You want to talk to something inside the cell, you grab a phosphate and stick it on it. And that makes some thing change their behavior, and then that thing will take a phosphate and stick it on something else. And you can stick phosphates on things, and you send signals that way. Phosphate's a very common signaling uh, mechanism. So, HDR changes its shape, which activates CHEA, which grabs a phosphate off of this little guy called ATP, and sticks it on itself. So now you have CHEA with a phosphate on it. Cool? All right. I think it's good. Cool. CHEA with a phosphate. Well, that's going to do something. The CHEA with the phosphate, well, you have to about that, is going to talk to CHEY and stick a phosphate on CHEY. Following? CHEY, now has a phosphate on it, it is going to come down here and talk to the full gel. Motor switch. And make it keep running. With the idea. So, how can you carry, how can you become light sensitive in a way that matters? Because having retinol that gets hit by light and changes its shape doesn't do a thing for you. Having retinol in rhodopsin attached to the correct, exact correct amino acid of rhodopsin doesn't do anything for you. They're just going to move around and they're done. 
And having those two things in place with the HDR protein doesn't do a thing for you. You gotta have this whole cascade in place. All these proteins that are oriented the right way, talk to each other the right kind of way, and you gotta be, be able to reset all this stuff, which is where these other arrows are coming in, right? Just because you put a, an a, a P on this A, CHEA thing right here, you gotta get it back. You gotta be able to yank that P off and get it back to normal so you can do it again. And that's what some of these other little proteins come into play. CHEB will come in here and grab that P off the A and turn it back into normal. Ready to get it again? <laughs> Gets off of that soup pretty quick, doesn't it? <laughs> pretty quick. Well, uh, and CHEZ, I think, helps reset the CHEY, so it goes back to normal. Because you've got to reset the whole thing. And, not only is that true, but if cell is in good light, it doesn't want to keep swimming so much that it swims past the good light. So cells actually can adapt. They can make the flagella say, hey, keep swimming, you're going in a good spot. But when they're in a really good spot, they can adapt to that. Say, okay, now shh, slow down. You're in good light, but don't keep swimming straight. Just hang out where you are, because this is a good pasture. You just, just stick around. And to do that, there's other proteins that help it adapt. Like this guy, CHB, now the P on it, because we grabbed it off the CHEA, is going to go up here and talk to HDR. And HDR is activated or deactivated by another chemical called methyl. Have you ever heard of methyl? It's a really simple uh, methane, right? It's related to methane. You've heard of methane gas. Methyl groups are another very common signal. But sometimes CHEBP needs to be sort of balanced and slowed down. And so CHER also talks to HDR. I know you didn't follow all of that. Probably. But we get this point. It is one thing to say. Look, we know how vision started. <laughs> it started when a single cell developed the ability to detect light. That sounds cute. What does it take to develop the ability to detect light? Well, it takes a lot. A whole lot. And this is just sort of the tiddlywinks chart, really. If you want to get more into it, there's a lot more detail you get into it. That's probably more your gig, isn't it? <laughs> He's a neuro guy. <laughs> he plays around this kind of stuff all the time. And so if you want to have a meaningful purpose of some sort of early, early vision, that is where a single cell can change its tumbling patterns based upon the kind of light it's in, it takes more than being sensitive to light. You have to have a whole network of communication in place for that. To mean anything. And so you have to be able to reset the entire system. You have to be able to integrate all the environmental signals going on. All those proteins must target the correct target that they're supposed to talk to and put the P's on or some of the chemicals on. They all have to be physically in the correct location, in the right quantities, in the right proportions to one another. In other words, it's a lot more complicated. We can hear, well, some simple cells developed a few light-sensitive spots in the membrane that could detect the presence of light and just swipe it off. Well, okay, that answers it. That's where vision began. That is insufficient. There's not enough empirical evidence to show. Okay, now, how's that going to happen? Tell me how that happened in a step. That has signs of intelligence for lots of reasons. All right. Here's some common objections to the idea of intelligent design. I'll wrap this up in the next little bit and give some time for some questions. Hopefully. Why is intelligent design not accepted? He fiercely, if so, in fact, fiercely opposed. Why so? Well, here's one reason, one objection to intelligent design. Look, here's the problem with you people who like to espouse this kind of an idea. If you can't explain something, you just impose designer to resolve your questions. And you stop searching. In fact, this is a really common argument. That uh, if you don't know an answer, you just say, well, God does it. And then you stop looking for answers. That is so demonstrably false as to just be, to be ridiculous. Um, as though science stops if you believe in creation or intelligent design. It doesn't. In fact, natural science, as we know it today, was began by people had a belief in God and wanted to know what his, his creation was like. It was the search for it, how it works, and why it works the way it does. Here's one another way to say this. This comes from this book called Science and Intelligence. Of course, many science, scientists have argued that to infer design gives up on science. 
They say that inferring design constitutes an argument from scientific ignorance. You don't know, and so you just say, well, it's clearly designed. However, this is a good reply to that, I believe. Yet design theorists do not infer design just because natural processes can't explain the origin of biological systems. But because, and this is important, these systems manifest the distinctive hallmarks of all intelligently designed systems. That is, they possess features that in any other realm of experience would trigger the recognition of, a, of an intelligent cause. I would put it this way. The design inference is based not on what we don't know, but what we know. It looks intelligent. And that's why we conclude. It's not the absence of evidence, it's the presence of evidence. If it's done right. It can be done wrong, of course. People jump to conclusions far quicker than they should. But if it's done properly, that's how it's done. And if you were to see something like that system I just explained, in any other discipline, in paleontology or archaeology, if you saw something like that in outer space, you know what the news will be talking about tomorrow? Intelligence in space, because that doesn't happen on accident. That has to be intelligently created. President Payne tells the story, and he was at Harvard taking an astronomy class. His professor came in one day, and he said, we think we have, for the first time, empirical evidence of intelligence in outer space. He picked up these signals, and it's a repeating pattern. It sequenced the time, is it, we've never seen this before. It looks intelligent. And folks, all it took to look intelligent was a sequence of repeating patterns. Ends up, it was what we call, call a pulsar, which is a star that pulses. And you, can, you picked up that, that signal. But they thought it was intelligence. How complicated is an arrowhead that you be able to tell? Not complicated. If you had anything that approached the complexity of that system that we just walked through, no one would question that in any realm of science, except biology, they would question. And there's a reason for that, which we're almost, almost going to get to. Second. second objection. This is really it. Intelligent design opposes the philosophical foundations of modern science. Anything other than a material cause, materialism, is impossible even to consider. Intelligent design should not be considered because it's not science. That's why they keep it out of schools. That's the argument. Intelligent design is not science. And it's not science because it's not based in materialism. Well, we introduced this at in the beginning of the evening for this reason. The science is built upon a philosophical belief, a belief that is not empirical, it is faith, and it fails to be this objective empirical discipline that it claims to be. In fact, it is founded upon it. And that is how you have quotes like this one, famously. Even if there were no actual evidence in favor of the Darwinian theory, we should still be justified in preferring it over all rival theories. How can you make that statement? Even if there were no evidence, it is the only theory that we should give credence to. How is that possible? Because of materialism is what you have to believe, Dar something like Darwinism has to be true. There is no alternative. Get that? That is critical. The reason Dawkins can make this statement is because he's a materialist. He believes in the philosophy, untestable as it is, of materialism. And he believes it deeply. And so even if there were no evidence, of course Darwinism is true. What other option has he got? There is none. Or this one, that puts it even more candidly. We take the side of science, in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories. I love that he used that phrase. Because, and this is the key phrase in this paragraph, because we have an a prior, a, oh, I'm sorry, that's kind of sense, a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. Now, is materialism empirical and fact-based? You can answer that. Just, you learn one thing, right? No, it's not. <laughs> the science is committed to the philosophical belief of materialism. 
And that's why they accept claims that are sometimes really hard to accept. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how misdefined, to the onion and the chain. A very verbose way of saying what Dawkins said, no evidence of any kind is going to dissuade Richard Buonta from being an evolutionist. Because before he had any exposure to evidence, there's an a priori commitment to material. You're not going to convince anybody who has that basis to be any different. It doesn't matter what the, what the, uh, what the evidence is. What you will convince is yourself. If you don't make that prior commitment to materialism, you will keep your faith grounded if you don't allow that. And people who are seeking and who are open to something other than a philosophical belief in materialism, they will believe in the, at least the possibility of something beyond nature then you may plant seeds of faith in them as well. And that's critical. Because the way science talks is this story's done. It's the edge, the fringe, and the who's who put up with ideas of the creator out there. Because they just don't understand it, but they need something. But they cling to it because they need something there. Was something designed? Science can answer, help answer that question. Who or what designed it? Science may be able to answer that question, or may be beyond the realm of science, because science rightfully is limited to the natural world. And if something supernatural exists, science is never going to scope it. Science is never going to scope God. You look to something beyond that. And remember, those are two very different questions. And that's it. All right. So any questions from you all about intelligent design? You're right at 43 minutes or so, 40 minutes. Um, I won't keep you long, no longer than 9.30, that's the, the latest we stay. Um, any questions? Yeah? What's the current evolutionary theory about what the simplest form of life was? Um, yeah, what's the current theory about what the simplest form of life was? Bacteria or... Something simpler than what we know as a bacteria. When do you call something life is part of the question, I suppose. The, the prevailing theory now used to be that there's the, prim the old idea of the primor primordial soup, right? Um, and that a cell arose in that sort of muck. We've learned that's just, that's why the fossil. Cells are remarkably complicated, remarkably complicated. The simplest ones are, in fact, I'm going to pull This um, is a reprint of the first edition of a biology textbook from some publishing company. A friend of mine in Kentucky is a cells uh, textbook director. Uh, this is uh, for some company. This is one of their earliest. Um, Biology books for high school, written in the 20s, 1920s, so almost 100 years ago. And his definition of the cell is less than a page. Should have brought my other book. Should have brought my cell biology book. Less than a page. And it's basically the cell has things in it like oxygen and some nitrogen and uh, some other kind of seven or eight chemicals that are in it. <coughs> and it has this goo that they call protoplasm, and that's where life is. Because as long as the goo is moving, the cell is alive. When the goo stops moving, the cell is dead, and so life is in this the goo inside the cell. The cell is a pretty simple thing. Darwin thought it was a very simple thing. Everybody did. He didn't have any idea. A modern day cell biology book. Find one of those. No, not, not the big thick version. It's eighteen hundred pages, at least. I should have brought it. It's the biggest book in my library, um, and it's an introduction to molecular cell biology. <laughs> Every chapter could have an entire book on its own. It's this massive volume. Now they can't even print the whole thing. Uh, so the newest editions have, have supplemental information online because the cell is incredibly complicated. So here's the idea. Life began as a molecule called RNA, ribonucleic acid. It's, a, it's very similar to DNA, which everyone's heard of, but it's a little simpler than that. And RNA can do things that DNA can't. RNA can act like an enzyme. Enzymes help other reactions happen. Some RNA molecules can do that. Uh, they can carry information like DNA does. It holds information, they can carry information. They can sort of copy themselves sometimes. So the idea is, okay, well maybe RNA could be spontaneously built, given enough time and enough soupiness, that it could, enough different types of RNA 
could develop, that they could start interacting in some kind of way, they could start copying themselves, and eventually somehow get surrounded by a membrane, and at some point that becomes a self-replicating thing. That's the theory. Though those even real strong evolutionists will tell you the theory of the origin of life is profoundly vague. Profoundly vague. Because it's just really hard to do. <laughs> really, really hard to do. Which is why one of the very common theories now as well is that life perhaps, in fact, very likely came from outer space. Because you have more chances of it happening if you have more places where it might happen. Um, so an asteroid brought it. Yeah, dumped Chase? So you put that Dawkins quote up there about even if there were no evidence, we right. would still hold to science, and Dawkins is a materialist. Yes. But I think the point of what he's saying on page 278 is that there is, in fact, mountains and mountains of insurmountable evidence for the things that you said at the beginning of the talk that you accept, like microevolution, right. change in species over time, stuff like that. There are innumerable Christians in the public arena who actually accept ideas like theistic evolution, things like that, and even speak about how those ideas are well integrated with the biblical worldview and confirm their faith. So how would you respond to evangelical Christians who right. have acquiesced to, to Francis Collins, who basically says Christians right. give up fighting evolution because right. it can't be overcome? Right, that is what Francis Collins says. Yeah. Um, yeah, those who have laid down, the, I would say this, one, they have laid down the mantle that Darwinism must be true. And that is that is flagrantly not so. I believe flagrantly not so. There's lots of really bad ideas that most people don't in every discipline. But that's true politically, it's true economically, it's true religiously, and it's true scientifically. There's lots of really bad ideas that lots of people believe. So no one yet, one, you need to get to the, to the realm of argument, which is not do populations change over time. Everybody agrees with that. The argument is how much can we change over time? That's where the argument comes from. And that's where the empirical evidence stops. I mean, resoundingly stops. So they can say, look, it's so obvious that all these organisms could morph from one to another. The rightful question to ask is, show it to me. Okay, show me the empirical evidence that a bacteria could become anything other than a bacteria. In fact, let's say, let's put it harder than that. Can an E. coli be anything other than an E. coli? And in all the tens of thousands of generations we have run through on, on bacteria. To my knowledge, we've never had a staph become th something that's other than staph. E. coli has never become anything other than a variation of E. coli. And until you can broach or breach that kind of change, then it's a just so story. It's not empirical, for sure. The data is not there. Um, there's a really famous uh, E. coli experiment. It's been going on since the 80s. This guy has had a single population of E. coli. Um, only biologists get excited about E. coli. <laughs> so he's had these test tubes of E. coli in his lab. And since the 80s, he's run the same population, just run one generation after the next, after the next. In all kinds of different circumstances. He's taken nutrients away and seen what happens. He's added nutrients to them and seen what happens. And what, what he's seen is uh, you can take a population that doesn't, is unable to digest a certain type of nutrient, put it in that nutrient, and eventually that population is able to digest the nutrient. It now has the enzymes to do it. Remove that nutrient, and in enough, to, in enough time, it loses the ability to digest the nutrient, which is interesting. At the end of all those decades and all those experiments, you know what he's ended up with, though? E. coli. He's got E. coli. Which is cool, so E. coli can change in some profound ways. I think a great question of biology would be, is there a limit to change, and what is it? Nobody's asking that question. And why is that? Because they presume there's no limit to change. So I think you have to ask the empirical evidence. Francis Collins would be a good one. Including the question, well, how did life begin in the first place? Of course, they would say, God did it. And then um, uh, theistic evolution. Story. The other failure is you, you don't want to lay down the, God, lay down the fight that uh, Darwinism is just so. Um, it's intellectually wrong to do that, which is why a good number of non-Christian thinkers are saying, you know, this Darwinism thing is getting all this hype, but there's some really big holes in that thing. Uh, Dawkins wrote that book, The God Delusion. 
now, maybe 10 years ago, maybe not quite 10 years ago, so the God Delusion, which is a very philosophically based book, he sort of got shredded by a lot of philosophers, actually, who said his philosophical arguments were, were lousy in that book. He waited out of his realm, which is empirical science, into philosophy. And they said, look, that, that argument is just really badly made. So without a lot of detail, that's my answer to it. You've got to show the data if you're going to make the claim that it's absolute, so give up the fight. I'd ask Francis Collins to show I think Francis Collins in particular, because he founded the Human Genome Project. Right. He, he led the national one. He had this quote in an in a interview. Yes, evolution by descent from a common ancestor is clearly true. If there were any lingering doubt about the evidence from the fossil record, then the study of DNA provides the strongest possible proof of our relatedness to all of those different things. Right. Do you know what he's referring to when he talks about Somewhat. the evidence from DNA? Yeah. What they do is they, they take the DNA sequence, say, of us and something else and compare how similar is it. Um, and you can measure, presumably, right? Basically, organisms with more similar DNA are more evolutionary related to each other. Um, that's, that's the theory. So, but there's a lot of assumptions behind that theory. One is how you line, and this is, there's technicalities that, how you line the DNA up in the first place to compare it matters. And it's one thing to say the DNA is really similar, therefore they must be evolutionarily uh, connected to each other. Says who? Says who? who says that? That has to indicate an evolutionary relationship with each other. Things that are morphologically more similar to each other, us and great apes, are naturally going to have more DNA uh, similarities to them than us in a, in a turtle or a palm tree. Um, and so there are questions about that. And good ones. At the same time, Chase, there's a lot of questions that creationists can't answer either. For sure. There's a lot of, and we need to be honest about that too. Because uh, it is a mistake to think all these evolutionary arguments could just be whoosh, swiped off the table as just ridiculous. That's not true. That's not true. And we don't need to play it like that either. All right, good. Any other questions? By any means. What are some of the questions that creationists can't answer? Um, <laughs> There are many of them, I suppose. Um, that's a really good question. Let's see if I can think of anything coming to mind. How about what? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, right. One of the common, common uh, theory, the common theory today. Where did our cells that have nucleus in them? Um, we also have things called mitochondria. Give us a little power. You know, give us our energy. The theory is those originated as a as a bacteria cell of some sort, some sort of. Uh, it's their bacteria, it's an early cell, because they have their own, they have two membranes around them. Are the mitochondria? I have a mark that I draw it. Now, those of you who take my class, you know how to say that would be. <laughs> there's an early cell, and there's a little prokaryotic cell. Our cells have in them, that's the same cell, uh, we have a big nucleus here with DNA in it, and we have these little structures called mitochondria that actually have two membranes in them. There's one, there's a little squirrely one, wiggly one on the inside. The theory is this mitochondria that gives us energy used to be this cell. It's called the endosymbiont theory. That in evolutionary time, this thing was engulfed by this cell. And instead of being killed or eaten or digested or something else, um, it actually was incorporated and it kept uh, this extra membrane around it. The cells, when they, when they get the cell work to bring it in, it sort of hugs it in a cellular hub, as you end up with this thing <laughs> here, with a piece of this membrane on the outside. <laughs> and normally, when that happens, this thing gets digested or spewed out or something, right? But maybe it didn't. Maybe it didn't. And this cell is actually able to use this cell, which has its own energy-making systems, and it was able to borrow some of that energy. It was able to get energy out of the cell. That cell is and so now our cells, that's how we get our energy. That's an endosymbiotic theory. And there's questions about this. Uh, this cell has, uh, this structure has DNA very similar to bacteria DNA in it, which is interesting. That's has some other biochemical characteristics, very similar. It has its own DNA, which is it's more similar to uh, bacteria DNA than our DNA is, which is interesting. Uh, it's cell membrane has characteristics, bacteria cell membrane, more so than our cell membrane. At the same time, there's weird things about it. Uh, most of the DNA that makes this thing work is actually in the nucleus, not in this thing. 
Right? So why is that thing so similar to bacteria? I don't know. If endosymbiosis is true, why is it so similar? I don't know. I can tell you this, I've learned. Be patient. There's been many, many cases of side, sign, seal, and certain. This is obvious evidence of evolution. Just give it time. We said, you know, that's not as locked tight as science thought it was. Every time science learns something, folks, we think we're big stuff. I think we know a whole lot. And we are as ignorant as we can almost possibly be about how this world really works. There is so much more going on than we know. Be patient. If your faith is in the Word, trust the Word. I don't know how all this fits in with Genesis 1, 2, and 3. I don't know. I find it very difficult to squeeze 4.7 billion years in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. That's hard to do without really violating the text, I think. But there are questions that I can't answer about that, too. And I've just simply learned to be patient with it and trust it. In the end, the answer is probably in the turn going to be, oh, that was it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I can answer that. Good questions. Thank you all very much for coming. I'm going to let you get out. I know some of you have other things to do. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, if you give me some final 30 seconds of comment. Officer elections are tomorrow evening. Ask Nolan or Aiden Mitchell or Brett or Laura. Or Laura. <laughs> they should know. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>